Hi, this is Christian Howard, aka Ken Masters, and you are listening to Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. Welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikel Casanova, and I'm coming at you with another phenomenal interview. And this time it's with actor, writer, producer, director, and voice artist, the one, the only, Michael Burhan. This man is truly phenomenal. He's also a YouTube sensation. He goes by the Nerd Genius on YouTube. And he's uh, also been seeing films over the years. It's just truly phenomenal. He's been in Children of Men, Brexit, Perspective, A Long Time Gone, Operations Neon Sky. And when it comes to TV, he's been in Silent Hill Genesis, This Job for Hire, Balls of Steel Episode 1, Psychic Private Eye. And when it comes to voiceover work, he's done an Elvis advert, All Quiet on the Western Front. And for radio, he's done I Got Gameplay, The Untitled Movie Show, Smart Out Movement Podcast, and he's also a professional wrestler. So this is truly a phenomenal opportunity for me to interview such a very well-versed, multifaceted, and just super talented individual. So if you're ready to do it, I'm ready to do it. Let's go ahead and welcome Michael Burhan onto the show. All right, and welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikel Casanova, and I have with me the one, the only, Michael Robert Burnham. Man, welcome to the show. I know we've been we've been really uh, trying to get this going for a couple couple months now. This is, yeah. hey, has been crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it has been. It's it's been a very busy uh, few months for myself and yourself. So I understand totally. It's uh, when when it comes to trying to get schedules together, it's it's kind of hard when you're busy. You know, yeah, you gotta find that definitely. one moment. <laughs> All right, man, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, plug yourself, uh, your channels, upcoming ventures, and everything. Where can people find you? Uh, my name is Michael Burhan, of course. Um, as he, he called me by my my uh, other name, which is Michael Robert Burhan. Um, I am an actor slash part-time YouTuber slash game reviewer slash um, general nice person. You know, I, I like to create stuff and, and make great content. Um, and I've had a 15-year career in this industry. So it's you can find me via michaelburhan.com, of course, uh, youtube.com forward slash the nerd genius, because uh, it's a, uh, a, a basically a YouTube channel I do to review games. I get I get a mixed bag of love and hate from people on that channel, so <laughs> it comes <laughs> with the field. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm a very outspoken individual. You know, if I see something's not right, I will always open my mouth and say, "Hey, that's not right." Um, and people don't seem to like that very much. And also, you have the the fanboys. Uh, depends if someone likes a game or someone doesn't like a game. Nine times out of ten, they all won't watch your video and then say you're wrong. Uh, which is fun, <laughs> and then start start insulting you, your mother, your pet cat, and everything else. Uh, but it's it's one of those things. I I enjoy criticism of any kind. I know everyone is very passionate, so I love discussing things with people. And I think we've got depending on what industry you're in, whether it, if, whether it be gaming, film, TV, the, the fans are very 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 passionate. As long as they're not sitting here insulting someone and calling someone names, etc. Well, that is that that comes with the comes with the territory. It's it's unfortunate too because I was uh, watching. I, th- I think you're friends with him as well. Uh, he goes. He used to go by Slasher, but now he's uh, Games and Coffee. Justin. He was. Yeah. He was saying in one of his recent videos, and I really liked it, where he was saying how the gaming industry, especially, everything's negative. Like if you like something, then people will call you stupid for liking it. It's like what are the the standard. I think it's the same with 
with everything. Yeah, to be honest. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's anything that has a fandom. Uh, because it has a fandom, it basically causes a situation where so many people, um, you know, go into a situation where they will constantly insult someone for liking something or say that someone's bad for not understanding something. And it's a shame because I think I, there, there are certain games like Lollipop Chainsaw. I love Lollipop Chainsaw. And there's good. a whole community of people who sit there and go, well, it's, it's terrible. It's the worst thing that James Gunn ever made. And, you know, she's a young lady and you can see her panties. And truthfully, behind it, it's a nice little single player hack and slash. I had fun. Uh, I'm a huge fan of zombies. So it's one of those things that I enjoy. And I think the negativity comes from the passion, in a sense, because mm -hmm. there is a sense of nihilism, especially with AAA developers. Because uh, a lot of them have been focusing more on the bottom line than mm -hmm. they have been in terms of their audience. So I get it. I understand it. Um, do I feel people need to be more positive? No. Like, speak your mind, but don't get into a rut where you start crapping all over everything, you know? Yeah. That's I've actually been, I've been running into that lately, too. Like, I think twice I've streamed Dead or Alive 6, and I've had people... Like send me DM messages like, how can you like that crappy game? You know, yeah. you know, it's it it doesn't play you that good and, and it's all about tits and ass. I'm like, well, if you follow Dead or Alive since I think it came out, what, ninety seven, ninety six, it's always been about that. It's, yeah. <laughs> that's and it's also thing. it's also Japanese culture as well, you know? Yeah. So and it's like it, it just comes out like people don't understand that, and then they're like, "The game's not that deep." I'm like, technically, it's basically Virtua Fighter, just faster, more fluid. It's the same layout, that's what same it, three foot yeah. layout. <laughs> it, it wasn't the creator, like one of the original makers of Virtual Fighter, as well. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. That's the reason. It's like uh, one of the creators of. Um, Oh, what was that fighting game? SNK, uh, oh God, Fatal Fury. He yeah, were, and and then King of Fighters. He was basically uh, one of the developers for Street Fighter. Hence the mm -hmm. reason why you had one of the characters named Ryu. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's just one of those things. I think people just get really uh, when they're engrossed in a the fandom. They're like, "Well, my fandom's better than your fandom," you know, and stuff like that. And it's yeah. just like, dude, you just gotta. Just chill, you know. <laughs> relax, <laughs> relax, oh. and just enjoy what you do. And but again, as I said, it's it's each their own. Everyone has uh, something they like, and everyone has something they don't like. I remember the lot of heat I got over Star Wars. A lot of people hated me over the Star Wars. Why well, I made a video on um, the episode eight, mm -hmm. and people got really annoyed. So yeah, that was that was quite fun. <laughs> You want to talk about that? I mean, we can. You, you can go yeah. into it if you want. <laughs> uh, also, it's just people hated the fact that I didn't like the movie. Um, and I did not not like it as in it was terrible. I didn't like it because I felt that Ryan Johnson threw out the entire continuity of it. Uh, now, go offline. Um, and it destroyed everything about what made the movie what it was supposed to be, the core canon Mm -hmm. um, the credence to what it was supposed to be and it's a shame it really didn't it didn't do what it was supposed to do and it didn't give the fans what they wanted and it's just it, it bugged me I think a lot as someone who is a big fan Like I love the original trilogy mm. um, I hated the prequels Mm -hmm. But uh, um, I didn't hate with a passion. I just felt Hayden Christensen was a better. He was funny by backstage, but as Darth Vader, he was terrible. Um, and these movies, it started off very well, but then it just tanked because Ryan Johnson was like, I want to do my own thing. They kind of let him do his own thing. And there was great moments, but as an overall story, it just didn't work. Yeah, And it, it bugged me. And, you know, as I said, I love Daisy Ridley. Uh, I love John Boyega. I love everybody associated and involved in that. I just didn't feel it, it was supposed to give what it was supposed to give, you know. And it's a shame. And as, as a gamer as well, um, 
uh, there's a lot of stuff that I have rather hit and misses with as well because it just it, there's a lot of stuff that lacks focus and it's and in terms of what I like and dislike the, uh, a lot of people will disagree with me like a lot of people love retro games I'm not a fan of it um, I, I used to get a lot of heat because I had an opinion on on several YouTubers as well because I'm not a fan of the ranting and raving type YouTubers. I don't like oh, them. Oh, the clickbait ones. Yeah. They, yeah, they I hate them too. Me. <laughs> guys like Alpha Omega Sin, um, guys, like even like the Happy Console Gamer now, they, they all do the same type of videos, and they don't, they've lost what made them what they were. And it's a yeah. shame, because now it's like ranting's become the cool thing, you know, instead of becoming the, the thing that we're supposed to appreciate or not appreciate. Um, and, and speaking out ha- is not just about speaking out anymore. It's about how can I make a video crapping on something just because I can do it? Yeah. And, and then you're left in a situation going, what am I doing? You know, what, what is it we're, we're trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? And a lot of people still like them. I know YouTube changed the terms of service on them as well. So if you've got a rant channel, they don't really support those anymore. Um, it's back to kind of the usual stuff in terms of what they, they... They want more prime content. They want people who can make stuff and enjoy stuff. And I know me and Xander had a conversation about this recently, who's been on your show as a co-host. Mm-hmm. Um, I have this... like He was talking about how his videos aren't getting seen from anyone else's you know because other youtubers get more than he does um Mm -hmm. and i always look at it as something your content will get seen it just takes time you know whether someone looks at it negatively or positively it will eventually get seen um but it's 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 a shame and especially when you've got those clickbait youtubers out there who just do this so they can make as much money as they can on something when it shouldn't be that way yeah <clears throat> and, and yeah. i, I, I kind of look at it too like i um i used to be friends with some of them up until i started to see and i'll just say it frankly i saw a lot of their bullshit yeah. uh, i saw a lot of things that a lot of these youtubers from you know player essence uh dreamcast guy a lot of them where you they basically want you to if, if you want to play a game with them or have them add you you gotta pay on their patreon or subscribe and give them like a donation i saw that bullshit i didn't like it i didn't like the whole thing with um basically they're so sensitive to if you say anything they dislike they'll send their goons after you like they're they're super crazy fans you know i've had that happen too like with um i think it was last year because someone Ask me my opinion on Smash Brothers. Do I think it's a fighting game? I'm like, no, I think it's a battle arena type game. I don't think it's a traditional fighting game. And because I said, (laughs) because I said that, uh, I got called out by Player Essence. And then because I wouldn't debate him, he wanted to go live and debate me. And I'm like, dude, I'm at work. I can't just (laughs) just get off work, like, right? And so yeah. his his fandom decided to like call me out, send me, you know, send threats to me, and then they started doing death threats, and they were like trying to dox me and all this other crazy stuff. And I'm like, that's the part of YouTube that I just have issue with. I think since then, I kind of kept my distance from other gaming YouTubers that are all about the ranting and the the yeah. theatrics. You know, and I just kept it to just myself, Xander, you know, reaching out to you and a couple others like Justin and whatnot. But there's a lot of BS that comes with YouTube. And, and, you know, I've had talks with Xander, too, and he's said the same thing about, you know, not getting seen. I'm like, dude, I've been on YouTube for years and I'm yeah. only now, only this year, my experience and growth. But it, it just it takes time, you know, and there, yeah, there's I've no... done seven years. And still, I'm on like 700 and uh, nearly at 750 subscribers. And it's just, it's just what it is. It's like, if you're a variety channel, um, or you're someone who tries to make different content from everybody else, no one wants to see it because everyone wants to see the bigger guys. Because if you cover something that the bigger channels covered, 
the algorithm will automatically go to your James Rolfs, you know, yeah. or your, um, your nostalgia critics, you know, or then your bus feeds, your like gaming, Kotaku news sites and stuff. They won't go to your small little channel until eventually someone finds something. And the whole thing about having a YouTube channel is people have to share your content. If they yeah. share and tweet it out and Facebook your content, it means a lot more than if you're getting found on YouTube. Because I always look at the algorithm and on my channel, I get like 5% coverage from YouTube. That's it. The rest comes from outside social media. Wow. And it is what it is. Yeah, you can't, there's nothing you can do about it. And it's it's a shame. Um, once you get to the level where you're over like 1,000, 2,000 subscribers, then eventually that happens. I've, I'm friends with some really big YouTubers and I don't, I never once ask them to like to push my stuff, push my content, because I don't, I don't agree with it. I don't believe that who I know should be the reason why my content gets seen. It should yeah. be because someone enjoys it and they want to share my video. You know, so it is what it is. <laughs> but <laughs> it's it's a funny little platform, and I think eventually it's going to grow again, and it's going to grow again, and eventually the time will come for smaller channels like Xander's because he's got he's got a very very good channel. Like yours, yeah. of course. And you're getting some scope. You're getting some range. And people are starting to notice your stuff because you're getting some big guests on your uh, podcast. So it shows that people do like to digest your content. But it's it's just going to, over time, it's slowly going to build up. What are your thoughts on the <clears throat> the uh, YouTubers that are up and coming or, or just starting? And uh, they have they, many may have this idea that to get found, they need to, uh, you know, they need to buddy up to a bigger channel or get them to give them a shout out or something like that. I know for me, I've been shouted out by much bigger channels like Amazing mm -hmm. Lucas, uh, the History Behind a Warrior, you know, but that's never helped me as my channel grow. It's because cool. The content's not similar to them. That's probably why. Yeah. Yeah, it's because their audience looks at him like, well, he's not like these guys, so why am I going to stick on his channel? Um, I've got, I'm friends, I don't know if you know a guy called Larry Bundy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, me and him, like, we're friends outside in the real world. Um, and he, like, he shouts out other channels, um, him, Slopes Games Rooms. They were shouting out a friend of mine recently who's a small channel, and she's getting a lot bigger because of it. Uh, and a lot of it is because people like her work. And mm -hmm. she's a really good, really, really good uh, YouTuber by the name of Trista Bites. So I'll give her, um, you know, a, a big shout out on that one. She doesn't need it because I'm smaller than she is. Uh, <laughs> but she's, her hard work is paying off and she's doing great for what she's doing. Um, the, the thing that I, I have for my content and my content being the type of content that it is, as I said, it's a variety channel. Uh, people, some people may like it, some people may hate it. I did a review for a game called Everspace, and I added a bit of comedy into the review. People mm -hmm. hated the video. I've got like over 30 dislikes over the review, because people are like, what? more game review, less you. We don't want any more of you. I'm like, okay. Um, but some, like when I did I did a review of Adventure Time, Secret of the Nameless Kingdom, that popped off big. It got me about fifteen to 20,000 views for the video. And over 20 likes because people liked the review and it, it just depends what people migrate to and what they see and the problem is as well is the fact that there are other factors that go into it um but i, I don't like using the position of i'm friends with this guy um because i once there was a joke where larry goes to me do you want me to do something with you and and collaborate with you and do something so that people will actually look at your channel and i said to him no because you're my friend i just want to hang out with you i don't give a crap about like the you know looking famous because i'm next to a famous person um mm -hmm. and it's the same thing way that i treat myself in terms of my ethos as an actor i always believe about being humble i don't believe when people sit there and go well you're an actor you know you're famous i'm like i'm really not you know or you're so cool it's like no it's just i do what i do I don't want anyone buddying up to me because they think they're going to get something out of it because I think it's a shitty way to be a friend, to be honest. <laughs> um, and expecting someone to give you a shout out, regardless if they watch your content or not, 
is really shitty too because they think you're after something um and uh, by the way folks i suffer from anxiety and depression so i always have that weird feeling that people don't want to hang with me because you know they may think i'm after something but i always look at that and I'm just, and it it does bother me um but they are great people like larry's a great guy daddy mark iverson aka dj slopes slopes game room I remember when he was like a little, like small numbers and he was a small channel and I gave him a shout out because he's like, he was, I, I was doing a, a, a live panel mm -hmm. and he was on it and I went, that's DJ Slopes. He's amazing. <laughs> you know, I've watched all his videos <laughs> and he's great. He's doing really well now. And you, I look at those guys and I look at what they do and how they produce their content and they've got a great fan base. People enjoy their work. And I think eventually something will catch on and people will someday, you know, look at your stuff and go, that was great. You know, who is that guy? Let's find out about him. Just, it'll just take time. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, um, you know, and that's one of the things I, I've told other uh, YouTubers that I've worked with smaller ones. I've, I've told them like, dude, just make content that you would enjoy but also be able to make it presentable, yeah. like have fun with it because the, the whole core of YouTube yeah. is you. And I think a lot of people lose that trying to, Oh, I'm going to do gaming news, like, like uh spawn wave, or I'm going to try and do what, uh, not happy, well, happy console gamer, or alpha Omega sin or, or dreamcast guy or spawn or I uh, hate, RDT. I hate, alpha. <laughs> I hate the happy console gamer. Um, I, I think like I met him as a person. I'm not a fan. Uh, I've I heard a lot of people say that. <laughs> yeah, just, like between me and you, and I'm not going to try and start any drama. I was friends with him long ago. Him and Rob Man. Rob mm -hmm. Man's a sweet dude. He's a great guy. But my, I have a huge, huge problem with people who talk behind people's backs. Um, and the Happy Console Gamer does that a lot. I feel like he has a lot of issues. Um, when he start, he started talking behind my back, so I kind of walked away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I felt like the thing that inspired me about Johnny was I felt he was always so positive and he was always so passionate. And I think mm -hmm. that's gone now. And I think now, instead, he's kind of become this and a lot of people don't see it and i understand they don't see it but i think he's a very toxic individual he's unhappy with himself so he basically he, i don't even think he likes youtube i remember once he was talking about his fans like they were nothing you know like he just got fed up with them and he hated the fact that being a youtuber was you had to socialize with so many people um and then when I started finding out he was talking behind my back, it was kind of like I cut him out because I was like, I don't want to associate with someone who wants to talk, you know, to say things about me because it's not I've gone through a very, very hard life, um, especially it's one of the reasons why I'm an actor now. I've been through a very hard childhood. I've dealt with bullying all my life, having people beating the living crap out of me at school to um, even being at drama school and having someone like doing Chinese whispers and trying to uh, stop people from working with me because I was I looked creepy because I was the oldest student in the school. I was what? 28 years old studying my drama degree and this girl was telling people that I was creepy and not to work with me just because she didn't like me. Yeah. Um, so it was like Mean Girls. It was hilarious. And I knew about it and I tried to squash it because I was like, we have to work together. Mm -hmm. so can you stop <laughs> goodness um, but i've been through all that and then when i see someone that i looked up and i idolized do that it kind of kills that whole spirit and momentum you know and that's the problem i think that we're still in this age where people think and, and this is the thing you've got a lot of people and I, I hate the hypocrisy of the internet sometimes because you have a lot of people who advocate like anti-bullying we shouldn't bully one another and we should keep kids safe at school and people don't know that bullying results in people getting these mental health issues you know so many people have taken their lives have gone to severe depression and are at home 
not wanting to face the outside world because some dickhead thinks that they're, they're having a bad day or their life sucks, that they want to take it out on everyone else. And I saw this guy who was my hero, and Johnny was my hero um, because he got me out of a rough patch. When I was uh, at drama school and I was going through my divorce, Johnny was like, the, his content was what got me out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then noticing that, no, he's just like everybody else. It kind of destroyed that. And to me, I was just like, I don't want anything to do with this guy. Uh, luckily enough, he did block me. So <laughs> when, when I found out that he was that he was talking behind my back, I blocked him. Uh, well, he blocked me, um, and because I was I was so freaking angry about it. But it it happens, you know. It's for me, it just it it's another one of those things. I think when anyone in the industry, whatever you do, because I've met some some actors as well. Like uh, I've met guys like Val Kilmar. Um, who was hilarious. I did a movie with him and he kept, he wanted people, like there was this thing, the AD would go to us, don't talk to Val Kilmer. Just don't talk to him. Not allowed to talk to him. Not allowed to go. There's a, there's a bit of tape there. If you cross that line and talk to Val Kilmer, we'll fire you. And it was like a little feature on, on this film with him. So I'm sitting there going, okay. And this was when I was just starting out. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there eating my lunch and then Val Kilmer, <laughs> I just see him staring at me. I'm like, what, what the hell? <laughs> why is why is Val Kilmer staring at me? And then he would come in, and then he would go over the line. There's this tape that he put around himself to isolate himself, and other people were standing there, or like all the extras and stuff. And he's waiting for someone to approach him. No one has because we're told directly, don't talk to Val Kilmer. Mm-hmm. And then the next minute, I'm sitting there, just turned away, and I, I look up, and he's sitting next to me. And goes like, hey guys, how's it going? And we're just like, what the fuck? What is going on right now? <laughs> and I'm just like, good, thanks. And then the director comes up to you and goes, what did I say about not talking to Val Kilmer? And I'm just like, he, 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 he just sat here, what? <laughs> you know, it's it was hilarious because it was one of those things I was like, is this guy insane? Is he doing this on purpose? Is this a rib? What is it? What is he doing? Um, Oh, yeah, Peter O'Toole was another one. Peter O'Toole, uh, I don't know if you know about his past, that he used to do a lot of drugs, a lot of drinking and partying, you know. Mm-hmm. I did a film with him called Venus, right? Again, it was one line. I was on set with him. And um, I'm there, and we're in this, like, nightclub scene. And I come up to him, and I go, Mr. Mr. O'Toole, you are um, someone that I admire, that I love. That uh, I appreciate, and you you really are one of the true greats of the industry. And he's like, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then I, I I walk off, and I can feel someone staring at me, mm-hmm. right? And I'm literally across the room, and I turn around, and it's Peter O'Toole, just staring at me uncomfortably. And I'm like, okay, what's going on here, right? So I'm talking to someone after we're, we're wrapped for like five, ten minutes for lunch. I'm talking to someone and he comes up and he's staring at me. He's like, oh, <laughs> and just keeps staring at me and then walks off. And I'm like, the, what the what the hell's going on here? What is he doing? So I come up to him. And it's like, Mr. O'Toole, like, are you OK? And he just went, yes, I'm fine. Like, OK, great. And then I'm just I'm getting ready. We're prepping for the scene and reading my lines. And I can still feel someone just staring at me. And I turn around. It's still Peter O'Toole, just standing like, like this. Like his eyes, just beady. And it's making me feel really uncomfortable. So I went up to the AD and I went, is he okay? Is, is Peter O'Toole okay? And the guy goes, yeah, he's just completely wasted. And he's probably just doing this for a laugh. And I was just like shocked. You know, I was like, what the fudge? You know, what is going on here? You can and say it. I, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I was, and he's just like, look, dude. Just my advice is just ignore him. He's just taking the piss, you know. But he would do that. He would like he would be totally out of his head, and as soon as the director said action, boom, he'd go into a scene. It was like you never knew he was drunk. At all. Yeah, he's he was the, uh, an amazing, amazing actor. Um. 
But oh yeah, I did promise you this as well. The um, right when I started out in this industry, I I started before as a pro wrestler. I used to I wrestled for a company called the Frontier Wrestling Alliance, um, and a guy called Alex Shane. Alex mm-hmm. Shane was the guy who trained me, and because I wanted to be a pro wrestler coming from secondary school. I turned down a degree in um, illustration because I was going to do like graphic design illustration. I, my, I had a dream at one point to be a Marvel Comics creator because I was going to work for Marvel. And uh, then I, I, I started watching these wrestling tapes. You know, my first ever experience was WrestleMania 7, Hulk Hogan versus Sergeant Slaughter, mm-hmm. um, which is, has a huge history behind it. Now I don't even like Hulk Hogan. I think he's a complete douche, um, especially after the stuff he said. So I'm <laughs> like brother <laughs> you know but yeah just going through that um and then i um i got this opportunity to train because I, I saw the back of one of my wrestling magazines and it was called the frontier wrestling alliance training academy it was in london and it was in east london i think so i went there i met alex shane and i started training i then got into the company and started wrestling i was like the undercard guy um and they got me, my, my claim to fame was wrestling Eddie Guerrero at Crystal Palace Stadium. And it was in a dark match. What? He wanted a warm up. Yeah, it was brilliant. Uh, I, I remember coming in, I was like sitting there in, the, in basically this room, the locker room, just putting my boots on. And Alex comes and he goes, I've got a surprise for you. And I said to him, what's the surprise? He goes, just wait here and I'll tell you in a minute. But this guy wants to wrestle you. And I'm sitting there going, all right, it's probably some undercard dude or something, you know, getting ready for my dark match. And Eddie comes in, just pops in. He's like, hey, man. And I'm sitting there crapping myself because I'm just like, that, what the, you know, what? <laughs> and he's just like, hey, tell you what, man, we've got to go call in the ring. It's all you, man. All you. I'm like, I, and I know little to nothing, right? So he's getting me to call this match with him. We go in there. It was a decent match. You know, I was green as hell, but it was a halfway decent match. Mm-hmm. And once we finished, I came back through the curtain and I was scared, witless. You know, I thought I was, I didn't know what to, what I was doing in there. And he came out and he was talking to me. He was telling me about Mexico and like ways for me to kind of make myself more impressive as a pro wrestler. And, um, basically we had a big huge conversation this is when he left the wwe he was he was fired for a time because he had alcohol problems Mm -hmm. um and he was just into church you know and started becoming like christian and going more into his faith and then he came back to the wwe after and it was such i was riding such a high then i broke my ankle I ended up in a bit of a botch in a match. The guy gave me uh, a choke slam, snapped the, the bone in my ankle in like two. So I got taped up, told to rest, but I had two more matches to work. I was a stubborn idiot and decided to keep going. I kept going and my ankle snapped completely to the point where the, the ligament in the ankle hurts if I do anything excessive on it. You know, it's really sore. So <clears throat> I was told to never wrestle again. So I didn't. But um, luckily enough, I went to an audition with my brother for a Channel 4 show. And mm-hmm. there I was kind of courted to do more stuff. So I started doing more stuff with Channel 4, did some independent work. And then I got cast. I, I had an agent. I got cast in a role for a film. They went, it's a Pinocchio effect. And I'm sitting there going, what is this movie, The Pinocchio Effect? And I went, it's like a frat movie. So think about Animal House, you know, you're wearing togas. So I'm sitting there going, okay. So I'm wearing this big, huge toga. And I have to say one line, I'm getting paid like five grand for this movie. And I'm all hyped up. It's one one of my first big roles. I'm like, this is going to be everywhere. It's going to be great. So I did my line, did the movie. And then the the director just looked at me and went, everyone, whip it out. Whip it it all out. Everything. As like the Indian dude. I'm sitting there going, what? Whip whip what out? Right in front of me, there's a row of cocks. Like (laughs) penises. And I I kind of, my face kind of like 
drained and I was like, I'm, my career's over, right? My career is literally over. And it turns out I was in a porno. <laughs> I, I'm standing there and the director's going to me, whip, whip it out. Why don't you whip it out? I don't understand why you don't whip it out. And I'm like, yeah, um, no. <laughs> And then the AD comes up to me and he goes, well, you're under contract. And I was like, I know I'm under contract, but no. <laughs> so I basically um, called my agent and I said, you need to get down here. And she goes, why? I was like, get down here now. Luckily enough, due to some error in paperwork, they never got me to sign an NDA and they didn't get me to sign a contract. So in order for me to sign the contract and to keep the NDA intact and also for me to get paid, I would have to sign the agreement there and then. I refused. The agent came down. She's like, what's going on? Oh, oh, I see. She went over to the, the AD, then came back to me and goes, well, they say it's tasteful. I went, no, this is a porno. This isn't tasteful, like, nudity. This is That girl was literally sucking that guy's dick right in front of me, right? So, like, these guys had fluffers. And everyone's just started, and she's just like, well, one second. She went back and then came back to me and goes, well, do you know, they're offering you a co-lead role. And I'm looking at them going, what is this co-lead? And she's like, well, you have to wear a penis suit. And I'm still looking at her going, no. And she goes, well, well they'll double your money. So I'd get like 10 grand to, to play a penis. And I'm sitting there going, no, this is not happening. It's not and she's thinking about the commission at this point, going, well, you know, I, I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm done, right? So we leave after she has a huge, intense negotiation with these guys because she's still trying to get paid. And she drives me home, and I'm sitting there in her car, and she goes, um, so I'm fired, aren't I? And I was like, yeah, pretty much. We're done. <laughs> I'm not, not working with you anymore. Don't even understand how, how this happened. And uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of ended that way. And then uh, I, I kept muddling on through my career. I don't even know because that woman works as an agent anymore, but she was, it was a really weird situation. And it was, it was funny because it was on a casting website, right? And no one knew how a porno got on a casting website. And they still, to this day, they still say, well, it's, you know, it wasn't a porno, it was tasteful. And that isn't, ta that's a porno. That's a penis. You know, that, that thing right in front of me. That, that girl's just, yeah, she's going to town on that. That's not, that's, this, is, this is not <laughs> what a feature film does. You know, this is an avant-garde cinema. This is, um, this is porn. So, yeah. Oh, look, he just ejaculated. Okay, that's great. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the weirdest, weirdest thing. In, a, in my history as an actor for 15 years I've never, nothing's ever topped it believe it or not, in terms of uh, being the most silly thing I've ever been in, but it, it just it's insane <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting uh, that kind of a story, that, that's I, I can only imagine the level of awkward you were, you were experiencing being there, you're like oh Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, no, I'm not. No, <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> like, there's like no amount. Because the thing is, like, if you were to have done that, you could never live that down. No, I would always be the guy who was in the porno. Like, you, you see some some uh, actresses who try to make uh, something of themselves past porno, like Mia Khalifa, for mm -hmm. example. Jenna Jameson is another one where. They tried to come out of that, but they're always stigmatized by it, which is stupid because sex is sex. You know, I think people who get freaking brutish and upset about sex are freaking prudes, in my opinion. Like, it doesn't matter what someone could do as, as long as it's not hurting anybody. And as long as, like, everyone's of legal consenting age, I have no issue. Right. That's that's fine by me. But the moment we stigmatize it and treat the industry like we treat guys like Ron Jeremy for instance as legends right Ron Jeremy's in everything people love him yet you treat Mia Khalifa like she's a whore or Jenna Jameson like she's a whore and it's like I didn't uh, and again 
it's not like I wanted to do it in the first place because no offense, I don't think I'd be really good in cornos. I think I'd be limp as anything. Uh, but at the same time, it's just one of those things like that. Once I was faced with it, I'm like, my career is over. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end up losing everything that I built up, which was only about two years worth of work. But I was like, any goodwill that I built up, any casting director sees this, I'm done. So I had to get out of there ASAP because it was like I was. I wasn't just embarrassed, I was shocked. And yeah. Was kind of, and it felt non consensual as well because I was misled into the situation. You know, I think the director was hoping that once people found out and the cops were already out, that it would turn into some weird orgy. But it was just, it was just fucked up. You know, it was completely messed up. But it, you got to laugh at it because it was a hilarious situation to be in. While I'm sitting there and they're trying to offer me more money to put a penis suit on, you know, and play and play someone's dick. So that that's that's my story. It's kind of why I call it my Joey story from Friends because it's like it's Joey with the photocopier, where he plays like the photocopier guy, and those people are having sex, and it's just like so. I go in there to change the toner, and then I just watch him have sex. Here comes my line. That's going to affect the paper tray. It's like, but it's as I said, it's funny, and I think it's when it comes to these industries as well. It's a nice little setup story. I told it my agent, who I have now. I I told him the same story, and he cracked up with laughter. He's just like, it's the, the, it's just the most humorous thing you can get into, really. But you know, since then, I've had some pretty good roles. I've I've been in some great movies. Uh, There's a movie that's on. Amazon Prime. It was partly produced by me. The script was written by me, uh, directed by Louis Denniston. It's called A Long Time Gone. Uh, mm-hmm. it's getting some good reception. It was originally directed in 2008. It's now um, available in the States and everywhere else. I did a TV show called Secrets on the, the Smithsonian Channel. I played the Egyptian prince known as Samtik. Um, that was fun because a lot of it was ranged with look. So my I had no spoken dialogue, so I had to use my eyes and my appearance as a way to kind of build up who I should be playing. Oh, and by the way, for the Hulk Hogan biopic, if anyone's watching, cast me. I'll be the most amazing Iron Sheik you'll ever have. I'll use his mannerisms and everything. It'll be brilliant. Uh, but yeah, it's it's funny. Like coming out from drama school and seeing the amount of opportunity I've been given is great, but I'm still just kind of, I'm a pebble in the large ocean of Hollywood right now. Like, there's guys who are a lot bigger than me. Um, and rightly so, you know, there's, there's some great, great actors out there. Um, but it's, it's it's kind of one of those things to, to watch as your career progresses. Oh, and I was also in a Chinese television series uh, in December, which was called Fist Fight. I played one of the uh, the killers in that. It's so weird because when they filmed my scenes, I had a larger role, but they cut me down to like 25 seconds in an episode. Um, and it turns out I wasn't even real. I was an imaginary character. So there you go. I spoiled, the, <laughs> I spoiled that for you people. But yeah, it's, I was an imaginary character. But it's, it's funny. It's watching, like, it's like voice work. No character you play is ever going to be the same. Apart from mm-hmm. that one dude who's a meme on the internet who plays himself and everything. What's his name? Uh, was it Miguel? Like, he's a Spanish dude, but for some reason they play him and he has it in every... Or was it Jorge? Oh, the, machete, like... the machete guy? No, no, no. Um, but he plays... He literally... Every character is named after that guy. So he plays himself in every movie he's ever played. He's in, like, Fast and the Furious and stuff. But he, he's... Like, oh! Being... I can't think of it. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, like he's the same in everything. <laughs> he's the same in everything. Um, but it's, you know, there's one question I actually want to ask you. Um, what do you think about the whole Dave Batista, The Rock situation, where he said that the, he doesn't believe The Rock is an actor? Um, I think, okay, so if I look at it as a mark, I'm thinking that what they're trying to do is build towards a potential Hollywood versus Hollywood type of match. Oh, at yeah. some point, okay. maybe WrestleMania 36, uh, because I I know that they're friends. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that this is just trying to build up heat. I mean, think about it. Like, look at some of the stuff that's been done in the past, and even stuff that's being done now, like with Ronda Rousey and 
Becky Lynch, like they're doing stuff on social media that's compl- that they couldn't even say on the TV. Tripped up on Becky Lynch though, which I thought was hilarious because yeah. they didn't want her to get so over, and she just got over big time. Yeah. So that that's a bit of a weird one, but I agree with you. Uh, I think when it comes to um, if you look at the context of this statement, I agree that The Rock isn't an actor; he's an action movie star. Yeah. He's like he's the guy that you would go to, like Schwarzenegger, like Stallone. Well, obviously doing it better than they are because he's making billions when they were making millions. Mm-hmm. And when he tried to branch out to other stuff like comedy, it didn't work. Like the Tooth Fairy failed. When he tried to do serious movies, it failed. People just wanted to see Dwayne the Rock Johnson blowing stuff up and being very muscular. Um which is fine. And he's got the charisma to pull it off as well. He's really charismatic. You can tell that he's one of those guys that can draw you in, you know. Um, so I have no issue with him being in that. But I think when it comes to the industry, everyone has a place, dependent on where, where you are, you know. Um, and this is a bit of acting advice for those out there who want some acting advice. Don't be frustrated that you're not the lead. Don't be frustrated that you're not the secondary work with the roles that you have because if you've got one line that's one line to show how much depth you can give the character if you've got a couple of lines that shows how much depth you can give the character on that side it doesn't matter what you do make the most of it play your role and if it's as flawless as it can be and if people react the way you want them to then you're fine Like I, I remember I watched an episode and I, I don't like our uh, British soaps over here. But I was what mum was watching a British soap and she goes to me, see that guy? I hate him. And I said to my mom, that's an actor. So if you hate him, it means he's doing his job. Yeah. And she goes, Yeah, because he's the villain. And I'm like, yeah, so he's the villain. So the writing, the acting and the direction have made it so good that you hate this guy. So he's doing his job. You know, so uh, yeah, you're you're basically making a success out of that. And I like that. I like, I like actors who can do that, who can slur, you know, slot themselves in and show what they can do and how much range they have. I'm a huge fan of character actors. Uh, Olivier, um, if you're looking at uh, blah, 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 Gary Oldman, Christian Bale. Christian Bale. Have you seen Vice yet? My God, that movie is great. His portrayal of yeah. Tony is uh, spot on, you know. Um, if you look at guys like uh, what's his name keep forgetting what his name is he was in Gags in New York My Left Foot um, DiCaprio? no 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 uh, There Will Be Blood uh, blah, 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 blah. it will come to me it will come to me he's another English actor he's a character actor uh, he played Lincoln as well he won an Oscar for that um, I would look it up, but you know I'm on my phone, <laughs> so <laughs> there's no way for me to look it up. But when it comes to like guys like that, the character actors are the ones I always have fun with. When people play themselves, you've got guys like Ryan Reynolds who always play himself, despite the fact I felt like his juggernaut was amazing in Deadpool too. Uh, you've got guys like Hugh Jackman who plays particular roles. Like, he's always going to be known as Wolverine, and he's always going to play certain roles that fit around his own character, you know? Mm-hmm. He's great in musicals. Uh, DiCaprio is another one that you named, who's... He's a guy that I would call... An, um, he's an amazing actor, but I would never call him a character actor. He's just... He slots... He's a brand. He's like Clooney, um, Jack Nicholson, you know, guys like that, who... They're, they're brand names. They're not... They've They've kind of gone above and beyond just being actors yeah and when you look at stuff like that uh, another guy um that you probably haven't heard of rufus sewell is another one he was in the illusionist he played the prince oh yeah yeah he's a shakespearean actor people say we look alike so you know cast me cast me as his body double um <laughs> with him he's like an amazing amazing polarizing actors. These are the guys I look to. I look to the guys that can give range. I I recently saw an interview that Nicolas Cage gave with GQ magazine, and he talked about how he built his characters. 
and that mm-hmm. he would use stuff in similar vein to like Kabuki. So like uh, he would take his emotions and his range from how the Japanese would do it. But he would also watch certain movies and take certain aspects of certain characters in order for him to portray those characters. And that makes a mark of a good character actor. It's despite he's very hit and miss. You know, a lot of people look at him and like, well, he's not that great of an actor. I loved him in Face Off. I loved him in National Treasure. I, I loved Nicolas Cage in uh, The Rock that he played with Sean Connery. Yes. Um, <laughs> he's, he's one of those guys that I think consistently can do really good work, depending on if he wants to do it. Uh, but he has done a lot of really bad roles as well. I loved him in Bad Lieutenant. Bad Lieutenant, I think, shined so much in that movie. He was just all freaking messed up, you know, really great. And he talked about that as well. He was he was talking about like um, how he used the method to stay into character. There was the director goes to him, Nick, are you are you sniffing cock? He's like, yeah, I'm sniffing cocaine. Totally. Go, going out. So stay off my fucking set. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, wow. Like that's that's taking to your craft, taking it to another level. And you, you've got to look at those. You've got to look at the range of what people can do. I, myself, um, I'm, I base my stuff more on Stanislavski. So I look at characters and emotions and trying to portray the characters as honestly as I can. I use like the thing called the six pillars, which the six pillars of Stanislavski, you look at like um, it's who, when, why, uh, oh, there's another word it begins with an I uh, you have to forgive me my brain is a bit fried because I've been uh, I've, I've taken on a part time job and doing a couple of night shifts so when you're going home at 6 o'clock in the morning your brain tends to kind of zone out um, <laughs> but looking at them I've, I've got my book actually let me, let me read it out my book I have the uh, Stanislavski toolkit right in front of me Okay, so Ooh. it is as I go uh, yeah uh, who, when, where, why, for what reason has it been written, and how um, does the setting go for the title, the character, the actor, etc. Uh, for those who want to study real acting, Stanislavski is where you need to go, because he's the daddy of everything. He he basically created the thing that, they, that Streisberg called in America and called the method, and that Myers and then duplicated from him. Guys like Streisberg, Chekhov, Adler, all of those have come from this this guy and his teaching. But it's wow. it's really, really intriguing. He's really good as well when it comes to to acting. Um but yes, uh, give me more questions. I'd like to like to answer more questions, Mr. <laughs> host. Oh well I mean I, I was getting caught up in everything you're saying. I'm like, just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um well I do uh you know, since you, you've had a lot of different roles in TVs and yes. movies, you've even been a director and a producer and a writer and so much more. Like, how has that experience been for you? Um, I've written before. And as I said, when I did Long Time Gone, there was a situation where the director basically had a vision. And at the time, and this is, it shows my age, people, it shows my age, we were using MSN Messenger to go back and forth in terms of what we wanted to portray for the characters and how the story was going to be written. And I wrote a 104 page script while I was trying to get into character so that we could give him, like this character was supposed to be drained of life, um, tired to the point of exhaustion. So I stayed up all night, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and I was just writing the script, got the script done, went to the direction slammed it on the table and said there you go that's done the the difference i think i'm an actor director so the actor director side is extremely different from being a um director who looks at visuals like if you look at michael bay michael bay does visuals he will do cinematography he will tell you what looks great how nice it is but you can tell in a lot of his films apart from pain and game i'll give pain and game a, a good a good chunk of that um he, a lot of his films would have the acting would become secondary to the visual effects. When you look at a actor director, someone like Kenneth Branagh, for instance, who I've worked with, they look at trying to help you build your character and set the scene. 
So you want to make sure that everybody does their part and does it well. Mm -hmm. So if an actor will, go, will try and say something, I can look at them and go, right, I want more of this and less of this. Can you go higher with in terms of your emotions? But I want you to like bring it down a bit more, you know? And then I let the cinematographer do his thing, his or her thing, um, by helping with the visuals while I focus on the actor and their ability to make the script come to life. Because the one thing I think people don't play on, because people think that a film was all about the actor themselves. It's not. It's about a partnership. So you're partnering with the director. You're partnering with the writer. You're partnering with the producers who are the guys who literally go after the funding. So they have to get you the funding. They have to make sure everyone's paid. They've got a micromanage on set. And the director controls what the scene is, where you have the um, writer who focuses on building the world. They world build. You know, they are the ones writing the scripts. Some writers do a bit of a minimum, like um, John Favreau once talked about how Iron Man 1, they had no script. I think they had like a page. What? And then it was him, Robert Downey Jr., who sat down and devised everything. And wow. They literally, as they, as they moved along, they, they built up like the script and the characters but yeah it's it's amazing sometimes how people work with what they have you know and how they mm -hmm. want to make things and i think if you've got a great cast and a great team behind you you can make some spectacular movies especially nowadays where micro budgets a thing you know people i've seen some stellar movies get made with less than a million and they go into festivals and they make a ton of money uh, oh yeah, Kevin Smith and Clerks is a prime example, you know. He made mm -hmm. that movie on, was it a 16 millimeter camera? And he paid for it using credit cards. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's all about the, the partnership and I think it's using what you have um, in your own toolbox in order to, to make um, I'll tell you a little story. There was a series I got commissioned by a Konami. Um, mm -hmm. the, basically, I pitched to Konami UK about an idea of making a Silent Hill TV series. They came back and they liked the idea and they wanted me to expand on the pitch. So I had a cast, I had a setting, and I was in the middle of writing the script. I had a team of writers. No one could pull off the idea of what they wanted. So I came back and I started writing what I wanted, what I wanted mm -hmm. to do. Because so I'm a big fan of Silent Hill. Um, but what the idea was to do a prequel and then focus on the first game, the second game, and then the third game to end the series. Um, it was it, gonna it, be it never should have went past three. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. It, it was going to consist of seven seasons. And when we were producing it, it was going really well up until a point where it died. Um, and it died because Konami went out. Konami was going into uh, basically, they went into a weird situation where they were losing money and they cut themselves out from everybody. They didn't want to talk to reporters. They didn't want to talk to anyone. And, and there was a huge issue where they were demonizing their own staff, you know. And they broke contact with me. And I, I finally got in contact with someone and they said to me, oh, just leave it with the reception. I was like, what? Leave the, the entire pitch with the reception. Once you've got everything you've done, everything you produced, leave it with them. And I said, no, it's my work. You know, we were supposed to have another meeting and we were supposed to get this done so we can then find a partner to screen this so that we can get the financing for the episodes where I was looking at streaming services like Amazon and Netflix. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and once once it got pulled out, I couldn't do anything about it because I had it confirmed by email. But when it came to the initial contract, they bailed and it, it killed the whole project. But I remember like stressing out so badly. It took me about a year, year and a half to get the series off the ground. Um, and by the time it was ready to go into production, we we lost the license, so I couldn't do anything with it. You know, I had to kind of bail on the project. 
And it was a shame because I think it's one of those, if told right, I think Silent Hill could have been a great um, film series or TV series. And it could have spawned off into like games and stuff like that as well. But kind of like, not the way the survival horror games that they used to be. I think something in similar vein to Telltale, like an episodic series, would have mm. worked really, really well. But yeah, it it bailed. Um, and it's it's annoying. I find being an actor less stressful than being a producer. Because being a producer, you're handling everything. You're, you know, you need to get the money. You need to work on the production partners. You've got to keep the actors happy. You've got to sign people to their contracts. You've got to get everything done because if it doesn't get done, then eventually it's going to die. You know. Yeah. Um, well, and that's literally what it is. Yeah, go on. Well, I was going to say, like, I guess now since Konami's in their resurgence, I guess you could say, probably could do it now. I think if I, they're on the same level of. If I want to pitch it, I've got to leave it with their reception. And oh, I'm okay. not ready to part with my vision just so someone else can take the ball and run with it. Mm -hmm. Because that would annoy me. Um, eventually, maybe give it another couple of years. Once there's a trust in place, maybe I can, I can get it done again. But who knows? It's annoying. Oh. oh, by the way, the, we, I, if you ever want to see the like the main concept art, there was a an amazing artist by the name of Tamara. Um, she made the art for it, and it was um, and we had like the first villain as well. It was like this human kind of goat deformed butcher. Um, and I can you know I I can put the stills up. I think it's also available on my actors page. But she's done some great work on that. I still need to actually pay her. I think she she deserves to be paid. So as soon as, uh, if it ever comes back and we do get some production money, she's going to be the first person that I hire because her artwork is amazing. Uh, she's I'll leave a Facebook link to her page, Tamara's Random Art, because she is she's simply sublime. But yeah, hopefully, as I said, one day, because I know Castlevania is doing its good thing on Netflix. They're looking at maybe doing using more Konami properties, but right now, especially the way they it's come out, how they treated their staff in Kojima as well, it's I wouldn't think it'd be the best of ideas to kind of give them an IP and say, "Look, we can do this with your IP. What do you think? Oh, my stuff is gone, and you you re you repurposed my stuff without telling me. Great." It's kind of like that. Um, I don't know if you've seen that game that's coming out in a couple of days called Left Alive. It looks exactly like Metal Gear Solid. Yeah. And it's using the same art style. I think it has the same person who did the art for them and the same font and same sound effects. And I'm like, but this is made by Square. So super, super weird. I thought it was a new Metal Gear game, but it's coming from Square. And I'm like, that's odd. Have you seen that Metal Gear's, uh, what was that one, that zombie one they did, was it Metal Gear oh, Rising? Survive. Survive, that was it, yeah. They sent me a, they sent me, they sent me a physical copy of the game to review, uh, which actually, you know, tying back to what we were saying about Johnny Millennium and all of them, that actually exposed to me how fake a lot of those YouTubers are, because they dropped reviews for that game the hour it was available for purchase. And the funny thing is, when they sent it to all of us, when we got physical copies, uh, there were instructions on it that even if you tried to log in, and I think a lot of us did because we were all on the same Discord server, if you tried to log in and play it, you couldn't because the servers weren't active until the day of purchase. But they dropped reviews covering the, the entire game but only based on the beta or the demo, not the full game. Yeah, it's it's basically <laughs> about getting coverage, and that's the problem. And I think the we all knew the game was going to be a load of rubbish. You know, some people gave it 
some people enjoyed it despite its many flaws but it was kind of it was a way to repurpose the metal gear engine to do something different and it just didn't work and i think it it kind of killed the i think it killed the franchise for good to be honest yeah, yeah. um but yeah no i agree with you it's it's a shame because i feel like games journalism isn't looked at as an art a lot of people look at it as um that it's a bunch of people trying to be real journalists you know and it bugs me and i think guys who do that who get a review copy and give something a glowing review because someone tells them to they give the rest uh the rest of us a bad name in my opinion they give the rest of the, the real journalists a bad name and it worries me because it eventually what these game companies do they hold you by a barrel and say well you either give it a good review or we're not working with you again yeah with someone like me they've said you know i've always said um when someone offers me a review copy i go i'm going to review it but i'm going to review it my way i'm not doing what you told me to do i'm not going to give it a good review based on what you say i'm going to do it and that's how i play it um and that's why i always do i've reviewed probably about 15 well no about over 60 games now on uh, my gaming series or other british review and i and i do it in such a way where i try to add comedy but i also talk about the game and it's and the things that make it work and not work and and i try to always give it a fair review so from one being the worst and five being the best and there's only a few games i've ever given, given a five out of five Mm-hmm. the rest of them has always been very middle ground <clears throat> and some really low because they're not really much there um, and it's a shame it really really is I think as we keep looking on in the market and we look on at what we're doing it, things will eventually start to change but right now it's as I said stuff like that that really just it really bothers me and I think with Konami as well they are trying to get back the kind of the goodwill, but it's going to be an uphill climb, you know. Yeah. As as someone who's who's worked with them and has been cut off by them, um, they they really don't they don't understand. I think like some AAA developers that are out at the moment, like Bethesda and uh, Activision, they don't get that people just want to play games there was a time with like the uh, Nintendo and the Mega Drive and the Master System where you could just play it, pick up a game and play it. Yeah. Whether it was good or bad, you know? Um, now, they add microtransactions and all these other extra kind of purchases in order to get more money out of people. And it leaves the, the consumer in a state where they're like, what are you doing? Like, people ask for more of a story from Star Wars Battlefront, they gave them more in-game purchases instead. They asked for Destiny to be more inclusive with the audience, and instead of giving the, making the audience... Feel, and Destiny is one of my favourite games, I love it, right? But instead of making it more inclusive with the audience, they try to add tons more microtransactions and make the Eververse a thing, and and by doing that, you're killing all the goodwill and you're not allowing the audience to have a chance to kind of embrace what you do. I think Sega's doing right at the moment. Sega's doing amazingly well with the Yakuza series. Oh, I, have, I have issues with Sega. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can go into that because my issues with Sega is... Uh, I Okay, so like for Yakuza, Yakuza Kiwami, Yakuza Kiwami 2... Yakuza Six, yeah. I and the Shimu One and Two. So I got review codes for all of those. You know, yeah. I've I played Yakuza since the original one came out. In, was it 2000, 2006, 2007? So I've been with yeah. the series since the beginning. And working with Sega Atlas's PR team or their marketing team, that once on Twitter, like and and getting on their mail list, like. For a while there, I had no issues with like getting review codes. I could reach out to 
you know, they're really responsive. But then it got to a point where, you know, a game would come out and I had already requested it like months in advance. And I wouldn't hear anything back until like two to three weeks after the game came out. And they're like, oh, yeah. sorry, I got swamped. Uh, yeah, here's a code. Can you have this done in like a few days? And I'm like, this is a Yakuza game. Yeah, that's not as impossible. Yeah. But then I'm seeing like, you know, and not to throw, well, I guess it is to throw shade at this person, but there's a girl on, called Jade on Twitter and she's, it pisses the ever living shit out of me, pisses me off because she didn't start playing the Yakuza series. And I've actually had her on the podcast and I, you know, I don't personally have any issue with her. I just have an issue with how Sega is doing it and how they're promoting her. She didn't start playing the series until a year and a half ago or a year ago. And because, you know, she's a female, she can promote the game. And there are a lot of guys who are trying to get with her because she's single attractive well, to them. I don't find her attractive, but anyway, it's neither here nor there, but because, you know, they're playing on that. Um, and then you've got all her fanboys coming out like, oh, she's the reason why I got into Yakuza or Jade should, she's the matriarch of Yakuza. She should work for Sega, blah, 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 blah. So out of nowhere, Sega's sending her games all the time. She gets them a month ahead of time or two months ahead of time. She gets the English, the Japanese version. Publicity, dudes. <laughs> Publicity. And I, I did an interview with Suda51 for EGX Regs, right? Did an interview mm-hmm. with him. Got his autograph and everything. And I was promised a game code for Travis Strikes Again. Still haven't gotten it. Wow. And he's also ignoring me on Twitter, which is nice. <laughs> but yeah. yeah I, I guess it is. It's just the publicity. Because I, I thought before I interviewed her that she knew a lot about Yakuza. But then on my interview, she couldn't speak. This is something Xander and I have actually laughed about outside of it because when I would ask her questions, she either wouldn't know or she couldn't talk about it. And I'm like, oh, really? She's like, oh, I've only been playing this for a year and a half. I'm like, but you are presenting yourself and Sega's presenting you as this person that knows everything about the series. Like, they're sending you even games out in Yakuza, like Valkyria Chronicles. They're sending her everything. And I'm like, you don't do YouTube. You don't review games. You just get on Twitter and guys who are thirsty will go after it and follow you thinking they got a shot with you. Like it, it's just, if but it's not it their fault, it's not her fault per se. It's their fault. It is. Their fault. It's the, it's the, one of my part time jobs is I work at a nightclub mm-hmm. and you see how desperate certain guys can get as the night gets on. Like they will, there's been situations where we had to tell guys to chill out because they would be harassing drunk girls, you know. Um, I think the misconception, and a lot of people go on about how these female streamers who are not really gamers and stuff get so many review codes and game companies want to partner with them. It's because they have such a male fan base who want to and it's, again it's not the female's fault it's the male misconception of these guys thinking if i'm her friend if i'm her fan i'll get to bed her and if i get to bed her then i may be her boyfriend you know do you know what i mean and it's i've seen it so many times and i feel bad for the person who's been initiated like jade she probably just sees it as wow i'm getting free games and i'm doing all this and everybody likes me you know she's probably not seeing it as these dudes want to sleep with me Oh, she's got a massive ego that she didn't have before. She has it now. And I'm like, oh, okay. Mute on Twitter. <laughs> it's, uh, mate, I've been there. I've had a couple of female tubers that I've worked with um, who went into a situation where they started using their Patreon as a way for getting guys to pay their rent by doing these weird little, uh, what was the girl's name? I forgot what her name was. But she did a video where she was begging people that she needed money for her rent and she was going to get kicked out of her home. And loads of these white knights came in and just threw money at her. No issue about it whatsoever. And then the next minute, she buys herself a brand new like Samsung phone. I'm like, what the hell happened to your rent? You know, all this, what, what, where's the sob story gone? You know what I mean? And then afterwards, she was like, 
just because you're giving me money doesn't entitle you to anything. And I just sat there and I was like, that is true. But at the same time, you kind of misled people, you know, and it got to the point where she had over like a million views on YouTube. Her, t her content was terrible. She had over a million views and so many thirsty guys were coming in like, oh, you know, can't wait. Oh, she's she's amazing. I hope I get to be with her and all that stuff. And it was just like, dude, you know, you're gonna you're gonna end up in a world of hurt. Yep. Very, very soon. And it's but yeah, I don't blame them. I, I think at the end of the day, it's and again, with popularity and with fame, it'll eventually die. And she's gonna be eventually back at the stage she was and wondering why the hell no one's responding because she's gonna burn so many bridges over this ego thing, you know. So that's that's kind of her fault. Um, what, what did I want to want to want to say? I'm trying to figure out, like, trying to get my thoughts together. Uh, so, in an ideal world, right? You've got you've got this lovely podcast here, right? Mm -hmm. And you've been interviewing so many voice actors. How did that come around? That's <laughs> one thing I wanted to ask you because. I'm I'm being being me, and I feel like I'm a small fish in a very big pond, uh, and I feel really like very welcome to be here uh, because you're basically interviewing me the same way. I'm in the same company as guys that you've interviewed before. How did that come around? How did you manage to get all these people to kind of, you know, come onto your show and and be attracted by you? <laughs> it is. It's going to sound crazy to say, but the only thing I ever did, I just reached out on Twitter, either Twitter or Instagram, sometimes occasionally on Facebook. I just message them or tweet to them or uh, comment on one of their posts. Like, I think. Was that the that, same with Dolph Ziggler? Because that's a big one. Nick Nemeth, man, you know. That same happen? thing, same thing with him, same thing with Goldberg, uh, Stone Cold. I just tweeted to them. That's it. So I'm That's hosting it. your podcast. It's the Hawaii's number one podcast. Would you like to come on? Yeah, like, okay, so like with Nick Nimeth, uh, Dolph Ziggler, yeah, I just, I asked him, I said, hey, you know, would you be interested in, in coming on Hawaii's number one podcast? You have a lot of fans out here love to be able to talk to you. We could talk comedy because he does a lot of comedy stuff. It's like, you know, you could talk comedy, talk, talk wrestling, talk business. And he's like, he just responded with the hook em horns. And then he started DMing me. I was like, cool. Uh, when can we get this worked out? He's like, sometime, maybe after WrestleMania, uh, when the season dies down, uh, he said, then I can probably come on when I'm not on the road so much. Uh, with Goldberg, I just tweeted at him. I was like, hey, you know, when would uh, when are we going to be able to see you out here in Hawaii? You have a lot of fans. You know, you're one of my heroes growing up. I'd love to have you on the show uh, and interview you. And he's like he, he uh, quoted and responded to my tweet saying, like, uh, I'll be out there in June for my nephew's wedding. I'll see you then. And then he I'll see, DM I'll see a live one with him. Yeah. And then like I responded to his tweet and then he DM me. He's like, Hey, what's your number? I'd like to talk to you because I'm not really one for, you know, Twitter like that. So then I gave him my number and then he called me. I was like, Is this Goldberg? He's like, Yeah. <laughs> and then we just we just started talking for like 10, 10, 15 minutes. And he's like, Yeah. He's like, you know, when I get out there, just I'll give you a call. Or if I forget, just give me a call. And he said, You got my number, and then we can go from there. And I was like, Holy shit. And same thing with like um uh with uh with Richard Epcar. When I interviewed uh when I reached out to him on Twitter, then I asked him would he like to come on the show. He's like, Yeah, sure. And then he gave me a he, t he told me to email to email him at so I emailed him and he called me and I was wondering like how did he get my number? Because like I got a California area code number called me and I'm like, who is this? And he's like, is this Mikkel? This is Richard yeah. F. You know, his super deep voice. I was like, how did you get me? He's like, your your number was on your email. It's like, <laughs> it says, I just decided to call you. But um, yeah, the first voice actor I reached out to was um, 
Uh, Griffin Burns. He's the main character of Shining Resonance Refrain. He was Yuma. And yeah. as that game came out, and as I was waiting for fucking ever for Sega to get me a code, I just reached out to him. And I was mm-hmm. I reached out to him on Twitter, and then he was like, yeah, I'm willing to come on. And he's, he's he was eager to do it, and he's the first voice actor I had on. And then I found out who um, the second lead character Son- the, for Sonya Blanche, that was uh, Dorothy Fawn. So I reached out to her on Twitter, and the next thing I know, she's like, yeah, I'd love to come on. So she was my second voice actor that I interviewed, and the next thing I know, I was like, wait, this is Dorothy Fawn. This is freaking Kaoru Kami from <laughs> Ruoni Kenshin. And... Uh, Meryl from Vash from uh from uh, Trigon. I was like, holy shit, she's a big name. And then the third voice actor was uh Michael T. Coleman from Street Fighter Five, and then my fourth voice actor was Richard Epcar. And it just I don't like literally all I do is just reach out. That's the only thing I do. And I constantly have people like, how are you doing it? I'm like, just reach out to them. Oh, well, I probably need to have so many subs or views. And I'm like, no. I only had at the time like a hundred something or two hundred subscribers when I interviewed them originally. What about when Twitter I reached? How many twi- Twitter followers did you have? Uh, Twitter followers, I have like, I think three thousand now. Not many As of now, by yeah. back then, I probably had like uh, two, three hundred. I was small. I still think I'm small. I've got a, I've got a tweet, Kenneth Brown. I'll ask him if he remembers me. I'll be like, "Hey, Kenneth, it's Michael." Let's meet up for a coffee. Be on the Kells <laughs> podcast. But like, that's amazing, dude. That is it's something that you've got to like really appreciate, especially from the way you're making your brand. You know, um, as someone who's, I don't think per se I'm trying to be famous because I don't believe in. I think fame is kind of a, a kind of a construct in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe in just basically being just doing what you do and doing what you're good at and doing what you love. Um, watching that and watching you grow and seeing how much goodwill you've built, it's a great thing. And I think especially that you haven't compromised who you are as well, which helps. You know, you wanna you wanna do the best you can and you wanna make the waves the best way you can. And I think that 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 helps. Um, so yeah, let's let's go for one last question before I have to run off. Okay. And, uh, did you want to speak about? Because I know you've had some complications with your previous agent. I didn't know if you want to speak on that. Uh, bring some awareness to that situation to keep other uh, actors or up and coming actors or anyone looking to get in to avoid that type of situation. Okay. Um, so if you're an actor in this industry, the one thing that we have is we all want to find an agent. We want to find someone who we can have a partnership with, we can talk to, and communicate with who can help us go through our journey. Because the one thing as actors that we have is it doesn't matter how much talent you have without the right person kind of pushing you or trying to move you into a certain direction, you're never going to get where you want to be. And that's, that's, that's a prime fact, you know. So I went into... Um, I came back into acting in 2017, had a bit of a life... Uh, a bit of a complicated life issue that I had to deal with and took a couple of years off. And I did a music video with this amazing director by the name of James Weber. And I then found an agent. And this woman's name was Elaine Eaglestone. She basically, the first day I met her, and it's a funny story, I went to an interview to come see her and she was in Northampton. She would not meet me in London. I had to go to her address in Northampton, her home address. And I walk in, and she's wearing a one-piece bathing suit, right? Yeah. And she goes to me. I'm sitting there in a, in a shirt and tie and waistcoat and uh, wearing my jeans because it was hot, baking in my kind of, like, you know, smart casual. And she comes out, and she gives me a hug and goes, I'm really hot. I do apologize. And keeps trying to pull her boobs back up to her top. And I'm sitting there, right? I'm a pansexual man. Uh, which means I like men, women, trans, uh, and it, and my sexuality also. I have this thing where if I have a connection with someone, I find them attractive. I'm sitting here in a room with this woman, 
and literally all I can see is her freaking chest. And I'm feeling really uncomfortable to the point where I'm just sitting there thinking, this is what the hell is going on here, right? So she gives me the big pitch. She gives me a script. And the script she gave me was terrible. And I'm sitting there trying to pitch myself to you know, do an audition for her, thinking, I'm going to fail this audition. She's not going to want me. And then she goes, I can sell you as a BAME actor, which is in the UK. It's, it's basically black, um, Asian, Mediterranean, kind of like Egyptian kind of stuff like that. Um, and I'm listening to her like about this thing. And I then reluctantly sign up for it for a year. I read the contract. The contract wasn't written properly. It was a terribly written contract. And I sat there. I was like, I could easily get out of this if there's a problem. And I'm sitting there going, let me give this woman a chance. Because she's obviously she's doing great things. But she promotes herself really well. And then I find out that the first thing that happens, I she keeps asking me for a website fee, a £30 website fee. For most who don't know, if someone asks you for money up front, do not sign with them. It's a scam. Yeah. Right? They can promise you the earth. They can say, I'm going to get you in these big movie projects. You're going to be in the big actors. It's a scam. Don't do it. I told her, respectfully declined, said I've got my own website. I'm fine. Thank you very much. You know, leave it at that. She then kept going on and on and on and on about this website fee. And I was like, no, I'm not paying it. Then she goes to me, I've got the ground level on this thing. It's a hundred pounds for this course. You should be a part of it. I was like, what course? It's only for people who are serious. I was like, what's the course called? It's an amazing, what's the course called? Okay. Motion capture. Um, yeah. It's new. It's innovative. I went, no, it isn't. It's been going on since 1998. Silent Hill 2, the majority of the game, they use motion capture. What are you talking about? You know? And she didn't like the fact that I was speaking out. Um after that, we got into more drama where somebody basically was, she was swearing and cussing this actress, called her a whore, uh, because I'd say that this girl slept around. And I'm like, that's not the kind of thing you want to talk to your actors about, you know? She was telling us you're not allowed to sleep with one another while you're on my books. And I'm like, my sex life is none of your business. Like, it's none of your business. The the couple there's a couple of things which became the straw that broke the camel's back she forced me to go to an audition for a movie she was producing based on her life story the audition meant nothing because she wasn't casting that day anyway it was all for appearances sake it pissed me off didn't want to be there well i put up a really one of the worst auditions i've ever done as an actor i walked out and the next day of a couple of days later after she said to she then after getting people to donate to a movie, mentions that no one's going to be cast in it. And then said to me, because uh, I'm very good at blagging and getting contracts on my own. I can literally find, it's the producer side of me, I'll find something, I'll talk to the casting director, and I'll um, basically get my own my own work. She wanted a piece of that. So while I was on the, the set for uh, a movie called Brexit, she had an argument with me about that, telling me she wanted the contract. I said no. Then she made up something while I was on my way to meet someone going, I need everyone to give me their contracts because an actor died on set. Now, this is a big news story. Apparently, an actor died on set and then the, her, her, um, that person's agent is being sued. I said, can you give me the name of the actor? Can you give me the name of the agent? No. Can you screen cap the article so I can see what you're talking about? No. I was like, look, I've been on Google and I can't find it. Can you tell me what it is? Then she phoned me up and started swearing at me down the phone. And then said to me, I want to dissolve this partnership. And I said, you can't because we're under contract. Right? You can't just break the contract just because you feel of it. Oh, the contract's not worth the paper it's printed on. Okay. Then the next day, when I was supposed to be on a film set to film a charity film, which was a gig I got myself, but she was attached to she's my agent. She then argued with them to make sure they paid her and that I didn't get a penny from it. And if they didn't, then she would pull me from the gig. They then pulled me from the gig, telling me they didn't want anything to do with the situation. 
and I contacted my union and we got into a bit of a back and forth, but then I left it at that. Cause I'm not going to sue a charity right over like kicking me from a freaking video. So I left it and then I didn't hear anything for five months and five months later, I get a, a letter to every single casting agent I've worked with trying to blacklist me saying I broke an NDA for a film I was in. And I sat there and went, I didn't break the NDA because I haven't taken any pictures off the film set. I haven't spoken about the movie. I've met my contract. And some of them said, yeah, we agree. Um, don't worry about it. Someone's harassing you. We think you should speak out about it. And then there was a few others who went, no, I'm pulling you. We don't want you on our books because this is drama. And the problem being is when drama happens, they will basically put it to the bottom of the pile and go, we ain't going to work with that guy. So that's pretty much the story. I, I released a video on my YouTube channel, youtube.com for slash the nerd genius. If you want to sort of see it, it's there, me talking about the situation, explaining everything that happened. I also have a PDF document that has everything, uh, all the evidence provided social media stuff that she posted. Um, and I'm also speaking out constantly about this because as an actor, no one gives a crap about the small time guys. And that's the truth. If you're on the bottom of the totem pole and you're not famous, no one wants to know. But if you're a big time actor and you're touting the Me Too movement, people want to know. And people need to know that sexual discrimination. I had a friend of mine who was discriminated against who didn't want to speak out about it because she was worried that her role was going to get removed from a film because she was being sexually harassed. I've had people who've been a part of scams who were told to shut up, including myself, who've been told to shut up because if we don't, then the industry is going to see us as hard to work with. And I think it's the worst thing that should happen, especially in this industry. I think when it comes to me or anyone else, people really need to start opening their mouths and saying something because if you don't, there isn't going to be an industry left. The people who are going to be left are the people who are going to be abused and treated like dirt until they get to the point of, you know, that hopefully to get to a bigger point so they can speak on it as a, using a bigger platform. But for everyone else like me and people in the small time, it's not going to work that way. And it's a shame because it shouldn't be like that, you know. And when it comes to every person out there, and if you're a new actor, there's always a few things you should look at. If someone says something that sounds too good to be true, it is. If they say, if they have over 400 clients in their book, don't sign with them. And I know you think having an agent is a be all and end all, but do it on your own until you get to the point where you can have a good agent. Because agents are useful, but you need a good one. You need the right one. Because if you sign with the wrong one, you'll end up in the same position that I'm in. And this woman is still working to this day. And I'm hoping, so hoping, that eventually she ends up with nothing so that she doesn't harm any other person again. Because she tried to, she's been very, very abusive towards me. Like, if you check in the bottom of the video in the comments, you see the nasty comments she's made as Willie Smooth. And the fact that she's gotten her other actors to comment and say nasty things about me as well. She's broken privilege. She's basically broken privilege with companies, saying that companies have said nasty things about me. And these are big companies, and it's gotten to the point where all I can do is fight back. Because that's all I have, you know. So far, my career is it's hanging by a thread. But I think eventually with my talent and with my now two agents that I have who are pretty good, I'm hoping that things will pick up. But we shall see. Wow. That... Yeah. Oh, that's uh... <laughs> yeah. I I I got nothing for that. That's that's <laughs> fucked up. Wow. It's the way the thing is. It's quite common, um, and it has to stop. And I think the thing is, you should be lucky to be in this industry. I agree, but you shouldn't be forced into something you're not comfortable with and be forced into doing things that you're not comfortable with. 
you need to start people need to start standing up for themselves and saying no and i know you think someone else is going to get that role that you're going to get that you were offered and if you don't sleep with the director then you're gonna you're not gonna get that role or if you don't sleep with a producer or if you don't do what the agent says that's not true because i guarantee you even if that role looks like an opportunity of a lifetime it's going to basically destroy your soul it needs to stop and i think the pattern of behavior that people can get away with whatever they want needs to stop but yeah that's pretty much it (laughs) um to everybody out there if you're listening to this i want to give you a great big thank you uh go onto my youtube channel give us a subscribe because all the subscribes matter um me and if you want to talk about things and you guys want to ask me and pick my brain in terms of acting tips i'm always here to listen i don't charge so there you go i can give you as much much experience as i can in terms of what you need to do and how far you need to get i'm not the most successful actor out there but i'm doing okay all right and we'll definitely leave links to all of your your social media outlets as well as your youtube channel down in the description below so for everyone who's watching uh, when this video is up or if you're listening to it on any of the podcasting outlets everything will be down in the description below uh michael i do have one very quick last question to ask you i know i lied with the last one but this one is uh this question it's very very important because it's something i ask everyone who's on this podcast did you have fun yeah, it's been great. And it's it's like I've talked to, I've been discussing with an old friend. It's, <laughs> you're very easy to talk to, very nice, very charming young man as well, I must say. I'm uh, not young. You guys, <laughs> well, you seem young. You're young at heart. <laughs> Trust me, I'm, I'm a bit old myself. You guys can guess at the bottom in the comments if you want. Find out what my age is. Um, but yeah, I'm certain I'm older than you. <laughs> Maybe I'm 37. Oh, I let the cat out of the bag. I'm 37 years old. Okay, I'm younger. Yeah, see, so you're a young man to me. I'm an I'm an old man. Um, but yeah, check it out, guys. Make sure you subscribe to his podcast as well. Um, I had a great, great time. It's been one of the most fun experiences. I've done a lot of radio shows and podcasts, uh, and this has been fun, especially when I've got a host who's let who lets me speak. <laughs> speak out you know, and say things and use swear words uh, I have to tone it down sometimes with, with some of the podcasts I've been on but you know it's been great hey. and, and very very enjoyable hey well I mean that's that's what we're all about on this podcast is all organic conversations whatever comes to mind you can say it I don't filter anyone because I feel like you, you can't really put that filter on speech if someone needs to express their experiences or something they've gone through or something they're feeling or thinking, let them say it how they need to. That's just, that's, that's how I look at it. (laughs) But to anybody out there who's a creative, remember to live the impossible, exist to inspire, do the best that you can do and work as hard as you can work because eventually your dreams will come true. Just make sure that you dedicate yourself. The one thing I hate, um, I, I came from a university where, probably only four of us from mm-hmm. a university of hundreds doing a, a you know doing theater and drama courses only probably four of us are doing it now four actors from that that same uni wow and it's basically because the people get disenfranchised with the with the industry itself because people feel there's not enough opportunities so hopefully we can change that let's see what happens um you know so Great. Oh, and any game companies, if you want me as a voice actor, you know, just just hit me up. Hit up my agent, Jim Parker, Faithful Talent. I would. I that's one of my dreams. I want to be a voice actor. I want to do all that stuff. Maybe maybe you should ask your your collection of friends and see if they've got anything for me. Like I know this guy. He's amazing. Get him. <laughs> I I think I could. I could ask because uh, Richard Epcar actually has his own uh, voice acting company and he does a lot of the senior directing for a lot of the animes and video games. So yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. I'll... Give him a go- give him a vouch for me. Yeah, definitely. Cool. All right. And everyone uh, who's listening, who's watching when this is up, uh, thank you for watching, listening, Michael, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It's, yeah. it's been an honor. 
Yeah, and uh, everyone, you'll be able to find this uh, episode of the podcast. It will be up on youtube.com slash Mikhail Casanova. You'll also be able to find this on iTunes, Google Play Music, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn Radio. Uh, we just got approved for iHeartRadio, so that's coming down the road. It was supposed to have been done in January, but it's taken a while. Uh, it'll also be up available very soon on Podcast One and Sirius FM Radio. So just but search. Can it play on my kettle? Almost. We're getting there. <laughs> we need to develop the technology where it plays on my kettle. Damn it. <laughs> oh, is there anything you want to leave the audience with before we go? Yes. Uh, this is Michael Burhan letting you all know that I've got gameplay. Have you? <laughs> awesome 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 all right and uh everyone we are signing out thank you for watching and listening love you all bye did you enjoy this episode of the casanova podcast well i hope you did and if you did please make sure you like share comment and subscribe and let us know what we can improve upon what you liked what you didn't like and all that good stuff and just make sure you always have a good time. That being said, this is your boy Mikael Casanova, my wife's favorite YouTuber. I am signing out and I'll catch you on the next episode.